Hello everyone, I'd like to give a short demo of reverse engineering string obfuscation as used in Phoenix Miner. Uh, first I've got Ida Pro launched over on the left, and we'll load Phoenix Miner just by dragging and dropping. You can also do file open. Uh, these settings all look good. Phoenix Miner is of course 64-bit, as it needs enough memory space to map all the GPU RAM to fit the Ethereum DAG, which is at least 3 gigabytes and still growing. So just go ahead and click OK to get started. At this point, Ida will load the file and start doing an automatic analysis searching for functions and strings and variables and other bits and, bits and pieces of information. Uh, for the purposes of today's demo, I'm using Ida version 7. There's a free demo available uh, and lots of resources for learning it. It's been around a long time. Uh, there's also a tool called Ghidra uh, by the NSA, which is open source, but I'm not super familiar with it. It's much newer than IDA. Um, you might also try this, but I'm going to use IDA for this demo. Uh, initially, I started this decompilation looking for JSON RPC documentation for Phoenix Miner. I wasn't able to find anything conclusive online, so I figured I would just take a quick peek inside and uh, figure out what's going on, and surely I would just find a big, you know, like a switch case with a bunch of strings or something like that. Uh, that's not how this went. Um, while the binary is loading, there's not a whole lot I can show you, uh, but one thing we can use is the string dump utility. Under view, open subviews strings. Uh, so one of the more common APIs is minor underscore get stat one. And if we just search for that, it's not found. Uh, even though this is definitely a supported API call, this gets you all the statistics about your minor. Uh, and this is really where our puzzle begins. So next, let's search for JSON real quick. Um, and this time we get quite quite a few hits. If you're familiar with JSON CPP, you might recognize uh, several of these are debug strings from JSON CPP. Uh, yeah, so for example, in JSON value, duplicate and prefix string value. Length too big for prefixing. Uh, is right right here. Um, also of note, if we double click on a string, it'll take us to the string and we can see other strings neighboring in the area. And if we click on the string uh, name and hit X, we can see cross references to it. So this function is probably part of JSON CPP that has been compiled in and uh, given an automatic name, it's just subroutine underscore the address it lives at. And C3 bytes in, hex of course. Uh, there's an instruction that loads into RDX the uh, address of this string. Uh, so basically, there's JSON CPP. Uh, that's really an implementation detail, not an API, and it turns out all the APIs as far as I can tell, are obfuscated. So, ah, good, Ida has finished loading. Uh, so let's go over to the function window. Usually, when reverse engineering a program, you kind of have to search around through here until you find an interesting function to pick apart. However, since this video is about string obfuscation and not actually the JSON API, we're going to look at an easy, easy way to find an obfuscated string by calling the main function. So to go to a function, hit, uh, click on the main window, hit G, type your function name. In this case, we're going to type main, which is one of the few functions that Ida knows about right now. And we get this mess of gobbledygook. Uh, this is kind of a control flow graph, disassembly, uh, it's very useful in its own way. It's very useful for optimi optimizing code, making sure the compiler is doing what you want. Uh, but it's not super useful today. 
for what we're doing. If your copy of Ida also includes hex rays, hit tab here. And this will perform an automatic decompilation into something mostly C compatible. This works great for code that was originally C, pretty good for C++, and really weird for languages like Haskell that don't really follow the same model. Uh, if we scroll down quite a ways in here, we'll start to find functions, the, this sort of pattern where we have several stack variables that get set up with values, and then a function call. And if we scroll down some more, we see it again several values on the stack, then a function call, then several values on the stack, then a function call. And let's go ahead and find one of these that's a longer one. Yeah, like this guy. Um, and we're going to double click on it to open it up. Let's make sure we get, yeah, V295. So double click on it. And uh, a couple things to note in here. We have a temporary buffer of 43 bytes. In C, this would hold a 42 character string. Uh, there's a loop, and it outputs bytes into the temporary buffer. There's, it, go, it does 42 bytes. Um, and then it looks like, I'm gonna make an assumption here that the function deobfuscates the string into this buffer and then it does something like create a dynamic string, something like std string from C++, uh, does something with that and returns it. Uh, so we're not gonna need that. Uh, but let's go ahead and let's go ahead and borrow this. And I've got a little setup here, a Linux box, and we'll just paste this in. We're going to have to do some modification to make sure that to, to make this into portable C code. And we're also going to do some modifications because we're not going to, like, we're not going to call these functions. We're just going to dump the context, the contents of the string. So I'll just quickly, uh, we're not going to return a void star. Fast call isn't real. Uh, we're going to rename this function to decode42. Uh, D word is. We went 32t here. Uh, we don't need that one. V2 is a copy of A2, which we removed, so we don't need V2 anymore. Uh, we also don't need uh, whatever this was. Uh, we will need to output a new line at, once we're done. And partway through, we're just going to output a character and we're going to output it uh, as we walk through the buffer. Uh, byte star is just really unsigned char star in portable C. And uh, I64 just needs to be a normal zero. Also int64, that's just a thing. I think that's from a Windows API. This is looking pretty good except for this guy. This is a weird little thing that the Intel architecture can do where you can write to read and write from parts of a register. So this is reading, this is writing eight bits into the register uh, that gets allocated for V3. But if we look at this, V3 gets loaded with 32 bits from A1, but then when it's used, it's only used with XORed with eight bits and we store out 8 bits, so those other 24 bits don't mean anything. So what we can do instead is just make this and, uh, an 8-bit variable, and that'll be fine. Uh, let's give this a quick compile test, see if I missed anything. Nope. Okay. So here's our ported string deobfuscation uh, function. Now this only works for strings of a particular length. 42-byte 42, 42 strings encoded in some other format. Uh, so let's go back to Ida and if we click on our function, hit X, we can see that main called it. Here we are. 
So let's grab some uh, input data to this obfuscation function. Bloop. And static. Yeah. Uh, this is a static char input. One sec while I replace all these strings. And now all we need to do is decode 42 to the input. Now this is going to give us some alignment warnings, uh, which we are going to ignore because we are on an Intel where they don't matter. Uh, someone should care, I don't. Oh, okay. So we got, we got something close to what we're looking for. What went wrong is if we look at the types of these, uh, these are mostly characters. 8 bits each, except except for the first one. The first one is 4 bytes, but we only have a 1 byte initializer. That means that there are 3 additional bytes, and because this program came from a little Indian platform, the 3 bytes go after. So we'll add that back in. And we get our clean, deobfuscated string, waiting 15 seconds for a previous instance to close. That's all there is to it. Uh, now, what's interesting is that in main, you can see a whole bunch of these functions. Uh, this one is probably pretty short. Oops. Uh, unrelated. That is not string deobfuscation or it's something else. Um, here's another one. This one does a seven byte string. Here's one, it does an 8-byte string. In C, you gotta subtract one byte for the null termination character. Um, here's a much bigger one, uh, 47 bytes. So what's interesting about this string obfuscation system is that they use seemingly a different algorithm for each length of string. This makes it a total pain in the butt uh, to deobfuscate these things because you have to manually de manually uh, port each length of string function and because they're assembling these strings on the stack it's very difficult to uh, identify the source data for the algorithm it kind of has to be done by hand as far as I can tell normally for a string deobfuscation like let's say there's let's say someone just encrypted all their strings with XOR FF you would take the entire binary uh, XOR it with FF and run the Unix string utility on it to dump all the strings out. It's easy. Um, and then you could look up the offsets and figure out where those things went in the initial program. Um, but with this, it's a lot trickier because each function has its own, uh, basically its own slightly different algorithm. They're, they're really just two kinds and some of these constants. Um, there's two kinds, there's this one and then there's another one that that has a second access to A1. Uh, these constants change. Um, this constant changes. So like they're, they're not super different from each other, but different enough that it's really quite quite a bit of work to decode every single string in the program. And you never know what you're gonna get. So uh, oh drat should have named this. Okay, let's name this guy. Decode 47. Cross-reference, this is called in four places. Uh, but interestingly enough, if we go on the left to decode 47, we're probably going to find neighbors that are related to it. Like right next to it is decode 65 
and right next to decode 65 is decode 73. And decode is just a name that I gave these, and 73 is the length that they seem to apply to. Uh, I'm just naming them that. That way I can keep track as I go through the program. Um, you know, you can just continue on figuring out, oh, there's something completely different. So uh, right here we've identified six of the decoding string obf sing, uh, de obfuscation routines. Seven, eight, nine, ten, and you just keep going. Oh, here is an example of a different style uh, where they reference the first four bytes XORed with the position in the string. Uh, additionally XORed with this guy that walks through the string. Uh, all those shenanigans. So, uh, that's pretty much covers what I wanted to talk about today. Uh, I hope you found this interesting. Please like and subscribe, and I'll see you guys later.